Uh, I was initially only going to give one talk uh, here at SmackForce, and Brian asked me a few months ago if I would give a second talk. And it kind of morphed a little bit over what it would be and eventually landed on something along the lines of uh, a basic things that has a lot of research behind it that not everybody's doing yet. And uh, I got to say that that really made me kind of palpitate. It made me pretty sweaty. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was good enough for this talk. And there may have been an email exchange at one point saying, I don't think I can do this. And we started talking some more and I realized, yeah, I'm actually really good for this talk because I do EMS ultrasound and it's basic, and it has a ton of research, and it's something that not a lot of people are doing yet, and you all should be doing. And so that's what we're gonna talk about, is why you need to be doing ultrasound. Um, we'll go over a bunch of different stuff. One of the things that I love to start with is lung ultrasound. Uh, this is a great place to go with for ultrasound, okay? It's there, the windows are huge, it's easy to see. So in this paper, these guys talked about doing lung ultrasound in a cardiologist's office, okay? So these patients uh, were found to have pulmonary edema on ultrasound, okay? 81% of them, though, didn't have any crackles. They had normal breath sounds. So that's kind of surprising. So it's essentially occult pulmonary edema. And you think, okay, well, what does that actually mean? Well, over the next couple months, 27% of them went on to die or be admitted to the hospital. So this actually is a clinical oriented finding. This is something that means something to these patients. So, okay, that's all well and done. That's a cardiologist's office. What does it have to do with ambulance? So this study was done in an ambulance. 42% of the time, when you're trying to look at COPD versus CHF, this changed management. That means we were only 8% better than a coin flip at determining if someone had COPD versus CHF. Do you think that you're 8% better than a coin flip right now? You probably didn't, but the research says you are. The research says that you're as bad at determining COPD versus CHF as you are at determining if someone has a pulse or not. <laughs> okay. So we're out here blind. We don't have an imaging modality, and, and this is where we are. You know, with ultrasound, though, we have something right here. We can determine if someone has CHF or COPD right away, and it's very quick and very easy to do. Okay. Heart failure, okay? So this is a study done of junior doctors, uh, obviously very good at doing clinical exams. These guys uh, did 26% of the time they could pick up heart failure just on their clinical exam alone. Okay, well that's pretty bad. Uh, but when you add ultrasound in, they went up to 94%. And what that tells you out there is it just highlights how bad our clinical exam is, how bad our ability to do this without ultrasound is. So uh, honestly, it's numbers like this, it's incredibly difficult to continue going forward without ultrasound in the field. So this is just heart failure. I've really kind of been beating heart failure up. So let's talk about something else. Let's talk about a super sick patient, okay? This is what smack likes to talk about, these sick and dying patients. So you get the shocked patient in front of you, you think that they have a pulmonary embolism. So you apply your ultrasound probe, you put it on the chest and you look for right ventricular dilatation, and then you grab it and you throw it on their leg and you look for a blood clot in their leg. 95% sensitive, 100% specific. Oh, I mean, that's, those are not bad numbers at all, right? There's not a lot of guesswork in here. This is no digitometer. So why aren't we doing this more? I don't, I don't know. You know, I think that's a fantastic question. This is extremely good. This is almost as good as a CT angiogram in your ambulance. So cool stuff with that. Cardiac arrest, another very sick patient. We've already kind of hit on this a bunch. I think we beat this one to the ground with the fact that you can't tell a pulse or not. 54% of these patients were in pseudo-PEA. So out of a group of patients that were in PEA, 54% of them actually had a pulse. So we were worse than a coin flip, coin flip by 4%. Okay. So we actually did worse. We'd be better off if we just walked up and flipped a coin. Um, of these patients, you say, okay, well, that's fine and dandy, but what about actual outcomes, okay? So patients that were found to have an effusion and actually had that effusion drained had a tenfold survival. Patients that were found to have pulmonary embolism and had thrombo uh, thrombectomy or thrombolytics applied had a fourfold increase in survival. And I'll tell you that that number, the fourfold increase in survival is actually lower than most other studies at looking at thrombolytics in cardiac arrest. So we're probably actually better than fourfold. So you can affect patients with this. You can affect patient care. You can save lives using ultrasound in your cardiac arrest. And this is not even talking about being able to eliminate pauses and all the other things like that that we can do. So it's pretty cool. Everybody loves to talk about sepsis, right? That's kind of the new hot topic as well. How do we diagnose sepsis? Essentially, we guess. That's about it. I'll tell you, that's me. Uh, I, I do it all the time. I have a stroke patient come by, a little old lady that's supposedly coming in as a stroke alert. I go, I smell urine. It's urosepsis. That's literally about it, and I'm right almost all the time, okay? <laughs> but can we be better with this? Yeah, absolutely. Ultrasound is really good with this. On patients that presented undifferentiated to the ER in shock, finding 
left ventricular hyperdynamic uh, state, so finding their heart beating at a higher than normal ejection fraction in the left ventricle, they're 94% specific at determining sepsis. So if we can apply this into the field, now we have a validated image modality that diagnoses sepsis. We can start talking about actually treating sepsis aggressively in the field, blood cultures, antibiotics, something like that maybe. I don't know. But we can diagnose this stuff. We're not guessing anymore. We're not just going, <laughs> it smells like sepsis, which is what we're doing now. Here's a little more mundane thing. Ended up being 50% of the total uses of ultrasound in my service whenever we first adopted ultrasound. Even the guys that thought ultrasound was dumb would still use it to start an IV because it was so useful in this. And there was this huge subset of patients we didn't realize existed that weren't sick enough to warrant an easy IO, but having an IV was great. So this was a study looking at vascular access nurses. This is people that do this full time. Probably the only people out there that might be better than getting an IV than us. And when they added ultrasound to their repertoire, they got 42% reduction in attempts, 26% increase in success rate. So that's pretty good. You know, this is good for the patient. This is a good thing to do. And we have it right there. We have this, the ultrasound system in your hand already. Why are you not doing it? Why would you not? It's there. So it's extremely useful. But this is what I really wanted to give this talk about. This is not basic. This is the advanced thing. This is just the cool stuff that I love to talk about. So this picture, the background picture, it's kind of hazy. That's me. Uh, long, you can't see, but I had hair then. Um, it's 2009, back when I was a firefighter paramedic. I uh, did this ultrasound. This was an ultrasound on an old lady that was having a stroke, and I diagnosed a middle cerebral artery occlusion using ultrasound in the field. Um, and this is the first time that a paramedic had ever done this in the world. And uh, so it's pretty cool stuff to play around with, but I mean, we can diagnose a stroke in the field using the Cincinnati Prehospital Stroke Scale. We're pretty good with this, especially if you add in a blood sugar. You're extremely accurate with that test. So why would I sit here and play around with ultrasound just to diagnose it? Well, I'm not. This wasn't for diagnosis. The goal was eventually to start talking about treatment using the ultrasound machine itself. There's a thing called sonothrombolysis, and it exists. You can break up the blood clot using the ultrasound beams alone. You do not need TPA. It's better if you have microbubble contrast agent. Now, this is not the contrast agent that arms your kidneys, debatable, but this is actually microbubbles, just tiny little bubbles, albumin, that's all they are. You can inject these and they could potentially increase your ability to break up the clot even more. But in this study, this was done on patients that were outside the TPA window. They performed ultrasound on their brain continuously. And when they checked at six hours, they're able to determine that 70% uh, of them were still, had, still had blood flow to the affected area of their brain versus 8% of the patients that had not had this done did not have blood flow to their brain, or to that part of their brain. This is no TPA given at all in these patients, none whatsoever, just the ultrasound. There's a lot of new technology coming out that you can do this with. Uh, there's hand-free devices actually that are coming onto the market, but you really don't even need all of that. You can do something as simple, it's just a regular ultrasound machine applied to the head. Getting dirty for science here. Ooh, machine's getting dirty. That's my middle cerebral artery right there at the top of the screen. You can determine that it's patent right there. You can reduce the depth even some more. Turn our gain up some. Make this picture even prettier. Some of these machines, there we go. Some of these machines have pulse wave Doppler, ability to do this and measure it in an actual form. There you go, internal cerebral or internal carotid artery going up and becoming the middle cerebral artery right up there at the top in the middle. And if you hold the probe on this for about half an hour or so, it increases my ability to walk out of the hospital significantly over TPA alone just doing this. If we were to add microbubble contrast, it'd go up even more. And if we add pulse wave Doppler, it'd go up even more. So obviously need more research on this, but Genentech's not going to pay for it. So. All right. Thank you, guys.
Good afternoon, Jason. Yes, sir. It's Mac Force News, as you know. I'm famous by now. Okay. Um, Apartment smell of fine mahogany, mini leather bound books. Pretty much. <laughs> Okay, so um, our viewers back home really want to know, um, given the usefulness of, of ultrasound that, that's clearly proven by your, your, uh, your talk here, um, why isn't it taught in undergrad or in I think it should be. It should be. Um, you know, in, for like paramedics, for instance, there's a friend of ours, a guy named Peter Bonadonna, that taught paramedic school back in the U.S. I think he was teaching this 13, 14 years ago as part of intro paramedic school. Uh, in New York City. So this was, you know, this is a thing that it can be taught. It's just not done very often. One of the biggest limitations was the fact that whatever agency you were going to go work for often didn't have the ultrasound equipment, okay? And now that the prices have come down so incredibly low to what they are now, I mean, when I started, they were 80 something thousand dollars for the systems. Now you're talking about you can get them for 20 and under. Um, so uh, it's, the prices have gotten significantly less, which helps a lot as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, then another question from our from our audience is um, obviously you've mentioned now that the costs have gone down, but there's there, there's this big primary barrier that we found in EMS, and that's that um, often in, in or at least in some systems we won't get to scan specific diagnoses or specific disease pathologies that often. How do you keep up your your competencies um, with scanning? Um, continuing education, just like anything else we do, you know, just because we don't do surgical airway very often doesn't mean we shouldn't know it. You know, that's how this is. You know, it's very easy to review other people's scans, have journal club once a month where you go over all the other ultrasound scans that have been done in the department. Things like this are very important in keeping the skill up in your agency and uh, continuing the, the quality improvement that you need to be doing. So there's a lot of stuff that we do in the ER as well because we don't see a lot of things very often, even as emergency physicians. And so we have to do this kind of stuff to keep competent with all of this. And paramedics just need to adopt the same skills. I feel like paramedics need to be at the same skill level as an ER physician because we operate alone without any uh, supervision, without any help. So we need to know as much as they do. And so we need to be doing a lot of the same CQI stuff that they do as well. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Um, we're going to be handing over back to our producers at HQ, uh, Brian and Ashley.